Greetings, everyone. Delighted to be hosting today's webinar and delighted that uh, we have a broad uh, spectrum of participants who are interested in talking about the recent Paragon Institute paper, Improving Medicare Through Medicare Advantage and Related Issues. And uh, welcome also to our esteemed panelists uh, and the author uh, of the paper from Paragon, Joe Albanese. Uh, and we have as our panelists today, Lauren Adler, uh, Josh Gordon and Chris Pope who will be joining us. Uh, delighted uh, really to ha have this conversation uh, with such a uh, well-read and uh, well-regarded uh, group of people who are expert in Medicare Advantage. Uh, a little bit of introduction about our panelists. Uh, Joe Albanese, who is the author of the paper that uh, we'll largely be discussing, is a senior policy analyst with Paragon Health Institute. Prior to coming to Paragon, Joe worked as a program examiner on the Medicare team at off the Office of Management and Budget, where he provided oversight of the Medicare program's funding and operations, uh, reviewing regulations and other administrative actions, as well as contributing to the president's budget for the U.S. government. Lauren Adler is a fellow and associate director of the Center on Health Policy at the Brookings Institution. He's currently a member of the Advisory Committee on Ground Ambulance and Patient Billing, established by the Nose of Pride Act and serves as an associate editor of the Health Affairs Scholar Journal. His research focuses on a wide range of topics in health economics and policy. Previously, Mr. Adler served as a research director for the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget and a senior policy analyst for the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, speaking of the uh, Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, Josh Gordon is the director of health policy at the committee. He leads CRFB's research into the effect of federal policies on health and, uh, and the healthcare system. He spearheads the organization's Trust Fund Solutions Initiatives and the Health Savers Initiative, which is a joint project between the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, Arnold Ventures, and the West Health Policy Center. Uh, Chris Pope, uh, who, as, as I said, will be joining us soon, is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. He was director of policy research at West Health, a nonprofit medical research organization, a health policy fellow at the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Energy and Commerce, and research manager at the American Enterprise Institute. His research focuses on healthcare payment policy, and he's published reports on hospital market regulation, entitlement design, and insurance market reform, uh, just to, to name a few things recently. So uh, as you can tell, we've got a broad spectrum of panelists who have uh, who have a really diverse background and I think a diverse set of views. And uh, we'll look forward to a discussion after having Joe uh, tell us a little bit about his paper. Thanks, Demetrius. Um, I'll just go ahead and share my screen. So as Demetrius mentioned, um, I'm just going to kick, kick things off with a brief overview of the paper we released a few weeks ago on Medicare Advantage. Um, this is something that um, we worked on for quite a while and got some helpful feedback, including from the other panelists, and we appreciate that. And hopefully this will set the table a little bit uh, for some of the key issues that we'll be discussing in this panel. Um, just to start with some of the overall findings and um, direction of the paper, um, generally we find that Medicare Advantage um, offers a lot of advantages relative to traditional fee-for-service Medicare. Uh, fee-for-service Medicare being a, a much more government-driven uh, program within Medicare <clears throat> um, has a number of flaws that we believe MA is able to correct on. Um, by offering choice of different coverage options and requiring competition between plans as well as other design features. For this reason, we believe that um, MA um, can be a platform for transforming Medicare overall, and the paper uh, describes how that can be the case. Um, but an important, um, an important way to do that is to improve on the program as it already exists. So the paper sets forth um, a package of policy proposals that aims to uh, save money for taxpayers, while also preserving MA benefits and access to uh, coverage options. And as MA continues to grow, um, the hope is that improving the program now will allow continued innovation and improvement in the quality of coverage. And indeed, MA has been growing significantly. Um, you can see in this figure on the orange, um, the orange data line that um, MA is now a majority of Medicare beneficiaries. Um, which far exceeds the estimates of um, other scorekeeping offices. 
And this is really a testament to the uh, value that MA provides uh, in, in a competitive marketplace. The decisions that consumers make is a very good indicator of what they value. Um, as I mentioned, there um, are ways to improve the program. It is a government program, and there is going to be um, a number of incentives and other design features that um, we think can add for a uh, better quality product. So this table um, describes the major provisions of the paper. And you can see at a glance what the uh, budgetary implications estimated are. Um, I'll go into some of the individual provisions um, shortly, but just looking at the uh, net savings at the bottom, you can see that we estimate about $250 billion in savings over 10 year period. Um, individually, these provisions are not all seeking to um, achieve savings or uh, make cuts to MA. Actually, um, there's a number of different provisions that we hope to balance out um, in order to have a, um, a package that not only achieves savings for taxpayers, but is also able to improve the coverage of the, of the program. So the first two provisions you can see are related to uh, benchmarks in Medicare Advantage. Uh, this figure describes the uh, current uh, the current state of MA benchmark policy. And you can see that the um, the blue lines represent the different um, county benchmark levels. Essentially, nationwide counties are split into four equal groups with their own benchmarks that are based on local fee for service costs. And areas that have lower fee for service Medicare costs tend to receive higher benchmarks and those that have higher costs receive lower benchmarks. Uh, first of all, the way that these benchmarks are calculated um, is flawed. The data that goes into the calculations uh, in includes, um, includes data from those who do not have both Medicare Part A and Part B. Um, even though MA plans themselves are required to cover both sets of benefits, um, this means that there are that there are a number of costs that are um, in the MA benefit, but are not captured in the benchmarks. And this actually overestimates or underestimates uh, payments to MA plans. So the first proposal in, in our uh, package of recommendations would change the calculation methodology so that it includes um, only data from those with both Part A and Part B. Uh, second, we would change the level of these benchmarks by setting them at a maximum of 100%. You can see with the left two blue bars that um, half of the counties have benchmarks that are set explicitly above fee-for-service costs. Um, we want to make sure that um, the benchmark and bidding process is able to achieve more efficiencies. And from the orange bars, you can actually see that MA plans are uh, achieving efficiencies in terms of their bids. So the bid is the estimated level of uh, the estimated cost of providing Part A and Part B benefits. And these represent um, bids in each um, in each benchmark level um, at the 75th percentile. So this shows that the vast majority of bids are below fee for service. And this means that there's an opportunity to target savings in a way that still preserves um, that still preserves benefits and access to MA coverage in the areas where this um, policy applies, which again would be the 115% and the 107.5% counties. Next, uh, talking on talking about quality bonuses, uh, MA plans currently receive a star rating from one to five, which measures the quality of um, plans according to how they perform on metrics selected by the government. Uh, plans with higher star ratings receive higher benchmarks um, through a quality bonus. And this chart shows that the cost of these bonuses has been steadily increasing over time, which indicates that plans are finding ways to maximize their star ratings. Um, there are two significant problems with the star rating system and with the quality bonuses. First is that the star ratings themselves um, are, not, um, are not a useful indicator of the actual quality of a plan. Many researchers and analysts have, have found as much. And for example, um, there are numerous metrics that go into the calculation of star ratings. Um, many of which are not tied explicitly to health outcomes. Um, and there's a, a number of process-based measures that are more of box checking exercises that don't necessarily translate into value for the end consumer. So this is something that policymakers have proposed ways to improve, 
But the second problem with the equality bonus program is that in a competitive market, and in fact, in most competitive markets, um, it is the consumers themselves who are rewarding plans or punishing plans and pr producers of a product based on the quality that they are providing. So it, it's redundant to have the federal government also providing bonuses and deciding uh, for themselves which uh, metrics are the best gauge of quality. Um, instead, it, we believe it makes more sense for the consumer to uh, to make that decision themselves. And so for this reason, um, the paper recommends eliminating the quality bonus program um, in the benchmarks. Now this slide focuses on coding intensity. Um, coding intensity uh, refers to the uh, differences in risk between the populations in traditional fee-for-service Medicare and Medicare Advantage. Um, currently, MA plans receive higher payments um, if their uh, if their enrollees tend to have um, uh, have tend to have higher expected expenses, and that can mean sicker patients are enrolling in the plan. Risk adjustment is meant to provide extra payment so that it would correct the incentive that would otherwise exist for plans to avoid uh, enrolling sicker patients. Um, but this also creates another incentive where um, plans are able to achieve higher payments by submitting more diagnoses. Um, so more plans tend to sub submit more diagnoses in MA, which leads to a different in what is called the risk score, which measures that uh, level of medical risk between the two programs. To correct for this, um, Medicare currently applies a 5.9% payment reduction across the board for MA plans. Uh, but you can see from this chart, um, each of the bars measures coding intensity for individual plans. And many of them fall below this level while some actually fall above it. So a one size fits all approach to coding intensity um, is not really targeting the policy um, in a way that um, that 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 would be uh, more advantageous. So the, the paper recommends um, targeting a tiered coding intensity adjustment based on the level of coding intensity for different plans. It would slightly increase the average coding intensity adjustment as well and impose a statutory maximum so that the government um, cannot administratively decide to target specific plans to an extensive uh, extent. Um, and we would also propose other changes to the administrative approaches to coding intensity, such as auditing of medical records to make sure that there's no exaggeration of diagnoses. But on the whole, this is a balanced set of proposals that are meant to uh, correct for coding intensity and achieve taxpayer savings while at the same time maintaining the underlying intent of risk adjustment. Uh, finally, I'll just talk a little bit about parity uh, between Medicare Advantage and fee-for-service, and that's something that we could talk a lot about, but um, specifically looking at ways to make fee-for-service more efficient and specifically looking at Medigap plans. Um, these are plans where uh, patients can um, pay a premium to uh, a, another private plan, the Medigap plan, and that plan will cover the out-of-pocket expenses when they use healthcare services. Um, and as you can see from this figure in the bottom set of bars, Medigap coverage is the uh, most popular form of supplemental coverage in traditional Medicare. Um, but they also benefit from a different set of rules from what other insurance plans, including MA plans, have. Um, for example, they do not have to cover Part A and B benefits as MA plans do, and they can um, deny coverage on the basis of pre-existing conditions. Uh, and the set of incentives and rules that Medigap plans face actually um, increases Medicare spending um, by up to 27%, according to some studies. And so in order to improve the efficiency and have more um, of an alignment in rules between Medicare Advantage and traditional Medicare, we propose changing the rules for Medigap, um, including uh, restricting the amount of cost sharing that Medigap plans can cover up to uh, until they reach a specific dollar amount. Um, there are several other proposals that also touch on uh, parity between the two programs and going beyond that, but um, the Medigap uh, proposals are the ones that have the biggest spending implication, and um, I encourage you all to read into the paper and uh, take a look at some of our other proposals. But with that, I will uh, conclude and send this back to Demetrius. Thank you, Joe. Uh, one of the things that I would uh, particularly say about the paper is that it, uh, it while it, it certainly has a point of view, it also um, addresses, raises, and discusses uh, the diverse perspectives that exist on many of these topics. 
And so it's a, just an excellent basis for a conversation like this that we're about to have, particularly with a set of panelists who themselves uh, might have a, a diverse set of views about these topics as well. So in that in that uh, the spirit, I also welcome the audience to participate by submitting Q and A's. Uh, we have a Q and A function. We'll have some time at the end here for uh, questions from the audience, and looking forward to, to those questions. I think though we should start with uh, with with dollars and cents. That always seems to be the uh, kind of headline when it comes to Medicare and Medicare topics. Uh, so it's a good place to to start. There's a lot of debate about how Medicare Advantage costs uh, and what, what, the, what the Medicare Advantage costs are relative to fee-for-service. MedPAC has estimated that Medicare costs uh, Advantage costs at various levels. There's questions about how spending estimates are impacted by differences in program design and spillover of MA efficiencies that uh, people on, on other sides of this debate or question have raised as well. How do you think this uh, topic informs policy changes to MA? And is, is it uh, necessary to achieve a particular uh, sort of uh, agreement on the technical details of it in order to consider policy changes? Uh, or is, uh, is there something uh, either in the paper or in the debate generally that uh, lends itself to a broader discussion? Maybe I can start with you, Josh. Uh, well, thanks. Um, and let me thank Joe and everyone at Paragon for uh, having me at this event. Um, it's a pleasure to discuss what I thought was a really good compilation of ideas for reforming Medicare Advantage. Um, the first thing I'll say in answer to your question is that there are some, what I would call wonky disagreements about how to estimate overpayments to MA plans relative to what um, it would cost to treat beneficiaries in fee for service. Uh, but I, I do think it's indisputable that there are large overpayments to MA plans and that's large even in federal budget terms. Uh, and that I, I do think MedPAC has tried to measure this in a bunch of different ways. And um, every time they've tried to measure it, they've found large overpayments. So we think MedPAC's current estimates are actually an improvement over past estimates. They measure coding intensity, favorable selection in MA. Uh, and for 2024, they estimate that MA is paid at about 123% of fee for service, which works out to about 88 billion. Uh, for 2024. And using those estimates, we've um, estimated that over the next 10 years, that winds up being in the range of $1 to $1.4 trillion in overpayments. So I do think there could be quibbles with this exact range, um, but uh, I really don't think it can be denied that there's a pretty large amount of money um, going into MA. Um, and so policy changes that save substantially less than that amount that I gave shouldn't be dismissed as like destroying MA or uh, even cutting Medicare uh, because um, this is extra money I think that's being sent to private plans who by the way make a very high profit um, in their MA business relative to other insurance business. So uh, the last thing I'll say is that it might very well be that at some level when we reform do reforms to reduce these overpayments that could cause beneficiaries to lose some supplemental benefits or maybe face higher cost sharing. But I think it's worth pointing out that Congress never actually voted to give Medicare beneficiaries higher or more generous benefits. And they certainly never voted to increase taxes or cut other spending to pay for those higher benefits. So, um, and, and those higher benefits are actually being paid for in the premiums of Medicare beneficiaries that are still in fee-for-service Medicare who don't get those benefits. Um, so for those beneficiaries and for the federal budget and the Medicare trust fund, uh, I think we should do something about overpayments. And I look forward to discussing more of those ideas. Joe, you have a thought about that? Yeah, and I, I definitely appreciate, um, I mean, Josh put it very well that th there's um, a lot of wonky debates you could get into, and and you used a couple examples, Demetrius, that are, are cited more in the paper in terms of how do you how do um, MA plans efficiencies for like utilization management spill over into the rest of the Medicare program? There's been some evidence that that's the case, but uh, setting that aside, um, it is still important to try and achieve taxpayer savings from a, a scorekeeper's perspective, even if there are some things that um, scorekeepers uh, might not be able to fully account for. 
Um, we, we know that MA is able to achieve real efficiencies in terms of healthcare spending. Um, and it makes sense to, pa to pass some of that along, at least to taxpayers, uh, given the fiscal challenges that Medicare as a whole is facing, and given that MA is now a much larger um, share, a majority share of the Medicare program. Um, I do think it's it's important to balance this in a way where where the, the benefits that are achieved through the innovations of plans are preserved. And I think it's important to give the plans um, and give the program more space to figure out how to meet beneficiaries' healthcare needs um, in ways that might go beyond traditional Medicare. Um, but on the whole, I think there's room to to achieve this without necessarily deciding, um, you know, between X percent and Y percent, this is the level that we need to achieve savings or how much we're going to um, just cut directly from payments. Uh, I, I mentioned some in the, the presentation, I'm sure we'll get more into specific areas, uh, but that's why I think a, a, a balanced approach is the best way to kind of um, get at this. Great. Anything from uh, the other panels? Um, and just, I'll just jump in to say, I mean, I agree. I think Joe is right that like, right, to some degree, the exact wonky debate of, you know, exactly what percentage Medicare Advantage is costing slightly more or slightly less than traditional Medicare for an enrollee is, is an important debate to have. But I think a lot of some of the policies in this proposal and some of the other policies that are proposed out there don't necessarily rely on that, right? I think Certainly, we do have clear evidence that there are, right, that patients in uh, Medicare, adva Medicare Advantage plans are sort of coding way more intensely than traditional Medicare like that, we know, and that is more than the coding intensity adjustment. You know, we, we, we have clear evidence now that there is at least some level of a selection problem, even for beneficiaries who kind of actually have the same diagnoses, that Medicare Advantage plans are good at getting the healthier ones of those into their plans. And we also know that there's there's evidence that there are real efficiencies being driven by Medicare Advantage as well. And I think to Joe's point, right, I think some of this is, and it's certainly when the program was originally, you know, Medicare Plus Choice was, came around, there was this idea that the government would be getting some of the savings uh, here. And I think right now, I think we're not in a very large plus or large minus uh, in, in the sort of current landscape. I also just think there's a broader sort of fairness and uneven subsidization question that Joe's proposal to sort of even out the benchmark uh, rel ratios relative to traditional Medicare spending get at that it is somewhat odd that we sort of enrollees get different levels of subsidies based on just sort of how efficient the, or sort of how costly the traditional Medicare program happens to be uh, in your area. Um, and then lastly, I think to Josh's points that is sort of made here is we do have a lot of evidence here that reducing benchmarks would have a limited impact on enrollees and that most of the reduced subsidies would come out of plan profits, right? Research consistently finds that lower benchmarks cause MA plans to price more aggressively and sort of, uh, you know, kind of a consequence of that it is uh, imperfectly competitive market here in Medicare Advantage, you know, and notably, right, uh, again, to Josh's point here, right, the evidence that we have, the estimates of MA profits right now are about four and a half percent of revenue um, or their profit margins within this, this business line. And obviously that's on a very large dollar amount because seniors uh, obviously have a lot of healthcare needs and a lot of healthcare spending. Um, so I do think the evidence suggests that like that, yes, there would be some impact on enrollees, but a lot of the the sort of the, the effects of reducing Medicare Advantage benchmarks would actually just come out of planned profit margins, which from a sort of social welfare perspective and kind of a public policy perspective, uh, I do think makes some of this uh, more attractive than it might otherwise be. So Lauren, you, you raised benchmarks and, uh, you know, it, uh, I think uh, maybe brings us to another topic to discuss here amongst the panel, which is should we tweak or, or maybe even completely reimagine benchmarks or the bidding process? Is this really a, a, just simply a matter of using different data or, or a different kind of administrative benchmark, or should we move to a different kind of bidding uh, system altogether? Uh, Laura, maybe you can start us. Oh, sure. Uh, sorry. Um, I, I think that is a good question and not an easy one. I think there are certainly political attractions to not sort of completely upsetting the apple cart. And a lot of even the sort of some of the competitive bidding proposals that are out there, including ones that I've written about, um, where you're just sort of saying, OK, let's make all the Medicare Advantage plans bid whatever their sort of cost of providing the, the Medicare benefit is, and then we'll sort of create a payment based on that. 
to yes, that there there may be some efficiencies to that. Um, it probably you know it, it's very dialable how much money that saves even because you could say look like right now the last I looked Medicare Advantage plans have about twelve percent higher actuarial value than traditional Medicare. The number may have changed since the last time I looked, um, but right you know to all of a sudden go down to okay Medicare Advantage plans are going to be bidding over like a plan equal to. Uh, traditional Medicare probably doesn't make sense given you have prior auth, you have networks. Um, you probably want to have some level of, uh, right, that is still a more generous benefit that they're bidding over there. Um, I, I do think you can go that direction and it has some attraction. Uh, but I, you know, I, I do think there's a, there's obviously a political appeal to uh, just sort of focusing on the administratively set benchmarks. And you can kind of get towards uh, some of these, you know, some of the solutions here. Uh, sorry, some of the end goals here. And again, right, part of what you're doing is trying to trim profit margins and Medicare Advantage to more reasonable levels. Uh, and kind of either of these approaches get at that. Then obviously there's the whole broader kind of premium support competitive bidding where you rope in traditional Medicare. Uh, I, I know the paper seems to have just sort of like put that to the side as a uh, political, uh, I think, calculation mostly, but uh, happy to kind of dive into that as well. But I'm uh, you know, leaving it aside in the, the sake of the, uh, the paper's uh, aims as well. Yeah, Chris, you, you know, you've written a lot about competition. Tell us. You were well, I, I feel like the, the language of administrative benchmarks or competitive benchmarks was almost obscure because the, the real distinction between the two is the simple one between defined benefit and defined contribution. An administrative benchmark is basically a defined contribution and a competitive benchmark is basically saying you're going to have to cover these benefits and whatever cost that comes out as or something relating to that that's the that's what we're going to give you so it, it really is substantively a question of how do you want to define the nature of the the fiscal contribution of the medicare program um what, what's never made much sense to me is to have bidding between ma plans and not fee for service represented as part of the competition um re kind of regardless of whether you go to bidding or or, or an administrative benchmark having fee for service not be part of the competition is almost like saying we're going to make the efficient ones compete against each other and then we're just going to have this big blundering competitor that's not really in the competition at all I, I, it's hard for me to envisage what what the policy goal is there um especially as you could essentially have a fee for service like plan compete on level terms with, with MA. It doesn't seem what doesn't seem clear to me what policy goal would be gained by leaving FIFA service out of the competition. There'd be a lot of downsides to it. On the on the profit margins, I think we sort of have we, we sort of this is almost part of the, the product of the, the way that MA payments are designed. Because if you think about the rebate structure in MA, MA plans are, are paid um a, a bet or are given a benchmark and then if they bid below the benchmark which is their their basic costs of, of 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 delivering the standard set of medicare benefits if to the extent that they did a bid below the benchmark they can provide some supplemental benefits to enrollees but they have to share uh, uh sorry 30 to 50 percent of those savings with the federal government in the in terms of the rebate dollars so there's been an implicit tax on returning savings to to beneficiaries and supplemental benefits on the other hand if you just keep it as profits if you or if you call it the costs of the basic benefit package you get to keep 100 percent of whatever you can deliver the standard benefit package for less than the bid uh, than the, less than the benchmark and so there, there's a real incentive in there for the plans to um to just say, oh, well, this was part of the basic cost and not return it as, as part of the supplemental benefit. So it's really, there's a substantial incentive in the rebate design that, that kind of skews it to just retaining the profits rather than uh, re returning uh, savings to beneficiaries. And that, that really is a, a pay payment flaw in the, in the way that the rebate structure is designed that before we sort of worried that it's inevitable that profits are going to be supersized the Medicare Advantage. I think we could um, address that, that pretty straightforward incentive, which is an incentive to retain profits rather than return them as supplemental benefits. Thank you, Chris. Let's move on to coding intensity. Now, that's another topic that uh, Joe 
uh, raised in his introduction, it's an important piece of the puzzle here. Uh, what should policymakers do to address coding intensity? Uh, it, it, uh, Joe talked about the, the important role that risk adjustment plays in Medicare Advantage and, and, and maybe even more broadly. And so is there a point at which the you know cure becomes worse than the disease in terms of undermining the, the purpose of, of risk adjustment? Joe, maybe you can start us off on that. Sure. And I this was something that I covered a little bit in my presentation, but just to expand on that a bit, um, I mean, the, the the point about the cure being worse than disease, uh, the, the issue is that we don't really know what point that is. Um, risk adjustment is something that is meant to address one incentive, and as a result, it creates another incentive. And um, the, the issue could come with having a, a policy response that's so strong that there are unforeseen consequences, which we've, all, we've already seen from the design of it. Um, I, I think just one other point I would make is that um, coding intensity, we don't view that as um, something that is necessarily meaning that there's like that there's illegitimate um, diagnostic coding going on at, at a widespread level. Um, this is definitely true to some extent where there's exaggerations or um, sometimes uh, there can be um, even going beyond that. And there's um, program integrity activities um, and law enforcement activities that um, are there. And, and we believe that expanding the audits of medical records is a very useful tool for cracking down on some of these. Um, but you also don't want to get rid of the incentive to have very thorough diagnostic coding um, that, you know, properly compensates for the additional risk of certain diseases, but also can help with things like care coordination. So that's why we we were a little bit more um, incremental and, and uh, careful about uh, not going too far. Um, Paragon recently released a, a brief that I authored um, that also digs a little bit into these points on coding intensity on favorable selection, um, where we don't really seek to just completely undo the estimated coding intensity adjust uh, in estimated amount of coding intensity, uh, precisely because um, there is some value to having thorough coding that doesn't exist in the same way in fee for service Medicare. So that's why we try to achieve the savings where it's warranted and um, make sure that there's guardrails against that as well, uh, against uh, going too far. Any other panelists have a thought here? Yeah, I'd just like to add in one. I, I just uh, from the presentation here on, I obviously I think there's sort of like a dream that perfect risk adjustment would be the salvo here. And like, yes, that is true in an ideal world. But I, I think it's worth just sort of highlighting a note of skepticism that there's, I think there's only so good risk adjustment can sort of ever really be when you have very motivated private actors trying to figure out ways around it uh, all the time, such that I, like having sort of plan specific coding intensity adjustments and trying to get, I, I think is more difficult than it may sound initially. And I, you know, I think there's sort of two, it's useful to kind of think about there's sort of two problems in thinking about the, you know, a very intense coding here. One is the sort of bilking of the taxpayer, right? right? That it's like, you know, you're, you're ginning up your sort of overall payments into Medicare Advantage. And then there's also this is it just sort of wasteful spending? Like, right, because you could just bump up the coding intensity adjustment a ton and then th there's no bilking at the taxpayer part of this. But then you have this sort of like, man, all these plans are spending all of this money like figuring out how to code intensely. And I, I actually, I don't have a good sense of sort of how big that second problem is in sort of dollar terms to think about. Um, and particularly because you wonder if there is some sort of limit to that, right? Like at some point, there's only so much you can code, right? You can diagnose everyone with all of their diagnostic codes. There is effectively a limit, right? At some point you are crossing the line into things that the uh, the RADV process can actually catch that are for fraudulent or quasi-fraudulent uh, codes here. Um, so I, I, I do wonder whether like, okay, everyone just sort of figures out, yeah, we analyze charts, we use some machine learning to kind of figure it out. And that sort of becomes not that costly, in which case kind of the more blunt instrument of coding intensity really does solve a lot of the problems. Um, and then I just, I, I also want to echo, I think, you know, the sort of uh, the, the recovery audit process here right now is still very, right? They they sort of talked about, okay, we're going to like find when you're kind of miscoding and sort of overcoding in an actual sense, and we'll penalize you and we'll sort of extrapolate that for that specific plan or that specific contract. But fundamentally, right, they're still, you're still, it's still in, in the plan's incentive to kind of try to break the line there. 
at least unless there's sort of a risk of DOJ action where you can actually get sort of penalized more than your actual cost um, there. But like that process still, you're just only looking at a tiny percentage of the actual contracts there. So I really think beefing up that program a lot um, would also go a long way to kind of uh, at least, you know, really cracking down on kind of the miscoding um, incentives here. I, th I think it's um, probably helpful to realize we, we often lump coding and selection together. If you look at the past 20 years, the selection bias towards MA has been pretty uniform. So in like 2007, 2008, it was around 9%. It's still about 9% in terms of the disparity between MA and FIFA service. Whereas the coding intensity uh, disparity is extremely recent. Um, MedPAC says that in 2017, there was maybe a three point, uh, three percentage point overpayment to MA. Now they're, they're saying that that's at 14 points, percentage points. So it's the coding intensity issue is really super recent, which makes me think that it's quite likely the case that there's a subset of codes that are driving us. I, I think it's quite unlikely that uh, you sort of have a lot of congestive heart failure coding on MA and, and, and no one is being coded that way in FIFA service. There are probably a subset of diagnostic codes that are kind of squishy, they are kind of subjective, they are kind of gameable. And it seems like it should be quite, quite, quite possible for CMS to go through uh, the, the the codes and, and really figure out which are the ones that are highly gameable. And if you look, especially a lot of the recent codes that have been added, and I, I, I do wonder to what extent. I, I'm not saying that this is exclusively what's going on, but we've seen a lot of social determinant of ho social determinant of health uh, codes added to ICD uh, 12 or, or what it is now, and added to uh, Medicare. I wondered to what extent this gets incorporated in the risk adjustment. And there's obviously a spectrum in, in gameability and the relationship with underlying medical risks. I think we uh, there's a lot of pressure in healthcare to sort of exaggerate the extent to which uh, the, the loosely correlated diagnoses or social diagnoses or things on the spectrum uh, of kind of uh, incidentally valid uh, um, conditions or incidentally relevant conditions, I guess, I mean. Um, I, I think we, it's probably worth pushing back on that a little bit. And I think by going through the codes, it, we can pro we can rein in what, what is really a coding side problem, um, more than a selection problem, which, which as Lauren said, you can kind of, that is more amenable to the traditional adjustments that, that, that you can make. Coding really, you I, I don't think there, there there is a simple way of going through this. And, and the chart that Joe said this, um, uh, that, that Joe showed earlier, really demonstrate this. Um, there are some plans that are doing a lot of this and some plans that are actually sort of undercoding. Um, and so re really kind of getting into the weeds of which codes are giving us a good signal and which which codes aren't is going to be a valuable exercise for CMS to undertake. And it's probably less fun than just kind of using MA as a pay for uh, legislatively. But I think it's ultimately what we're going to want to do to, to get value out of the program. Let me just say real quick that this is actually something that CMS has done or at least has started to try to do, is find those codes that seem to be the most gameable and either consolidate them or get rid of them for the purposes of risk adjustment. And that's the other point I would make to, to Joe's point, that we can still have physicians coding for all these diagnoses um, and just not use some of those for the purpose of risk adjustment. It doesn't mean your doctor won't know what, um, what ailments you have. It just means we're not going to include those as part of risk adjustment. It is worth noting, there is probably some level of trade-off here between the selection problem and sort of like you eliminate more codes, it is a little easier to select the sort right, the less diagnoses you have to sort of write, it gives you a little bit more room to, to have selection here, but um, not, again, it's, I don't think it's actually clear whether that's good or bad to, to some of Chris's points here. There also is sort of underreported story, I feel like so far here is that the accountable care organization program in traditional Medicare is now what, like half of beneficiaries within traditional Medicare. And they have very similar incentives to intensely code their beneficiaries. So as sort of the coding intensity within traditional, basically like the ACO program is sort of increasing coding intensity within traditional Medicare that actually will kind of help offset uh, some of the sort of issues that we were talking about in Medicare Advantage here. Um, and, I, you know, the larger the ACO program grows, if it does, 
uh, the more that'll sort of, uh, it does. And it, they, it makes it actually a little confusing to how you think about the sort of pros and cons of ACOs coding intensely uh, because it has sort of this offset in Medicare Advantage. I, thank you all. I, I, uh, I think that's an engaging exchange. I'd like to move us on to STARS, though, in the quality bonus program. What do you think about quality bonuses? Should CMS be paying plans based on uh, quality? Uh, how do they measure? How should CMS be measuring quality? And does the current system achieve that? That's a compound question. Uh, maybe let's start with Josh and yeah, well, that's it's good to start with me because I have a chance to plug our new paper that we released this week on the quality bonus program. Um, so, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of what what Joe said and what's in your paper, I think, gets at this uh, very well. That we spend fifteen billion dollars extra a year on these quality bonuses, uh, but unlike other systems where quality bonus performance sort of rewards high quality but takes away from low quality. The MA quality bonus system simply just adds money and lower performing plans don't get penalized, uh, at least financially, um, by the government. And, you know, uh, I think at the point where now 50% of MA uh, of beneficiaries for Medicare and MA, uh, we really should be moving to budget neutral quality bonuses uh, for that reason. And then Joe also mentioned this, that the quality bonus system is designed to reward high quality and produce ratings for beneficiaries to uh, choose and shop for higher quality plans. But basically everyone that's looked at the current system agrees that we're not actually giving useful information to beneficiaries uh, when they shop. And I think the easiest way to explain this is 85% of plans in MA get quality bonuses. So um, if all the plans are high quality, then um, really, no plans are high quality. It just doesn't give beneficiaries good information. Um, so uh, that's a another reason, I think, to um, look at the metrics, but also to at least make sure this is budget neutral. And then I'll just point to one unique factor that we looked at in our paper is that uh, employers and unions are moving retirees uh, onto Medicare Advantage plans, uh, but they're kind of choosing those plans for retirees, and they're getting to kind of select a uh, um, their own kind of bespoke selection of benefits in MA. And uh, yet even those plans are included in these quality bonus ratings. And um, that doesn't make very much sense. And it leads to more spending on quality bonuses than we should be. And so we think at least you should take these employer plans out of the quality bonus system. And that could save from like 20 to $35 billion um, over a decade. Uh, and I think that would be a good place to start if we don't have the political will to just move to budget neutrality uh, quickly, which would save a lot more. Joe, do you have a reply to, to, to that? Yeah, I, I think one of the helpful things about that paper and looking at one specific angle of the quality bonus program as well is that it, it just kind of sheds light on the, the gameability of the measures. And this is a problem that's um, existed as well in the fee-for-service uh, quality programs of which there are many. Um, the 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 fact that there's different metrics that um can that that some um providers can perform very well on or can't perform that well on but they're able to choose their own metrics in some cases the, there's um a lot of the, the way that you design a quality measurement program and a, a incentive program is going to dictate a lot of how um uh, of how plans and providers respond to it and so the, that's part of why we think that taking the government out entirely, I, I think that's just something that simplifies the process and leaves it to the competition within Medicare Advantage and among consumers um, is a good approach. But uh, even even then, if you were to continue to have a star rating system of some kind, um, whether from CMS or from some uh, private provider, um, it's important to have a meaningful way of distinguishing between plans and informing consumers about what the quality of their coverage is going to be or what um, specific areas they most value. Um, I haven't seen a lot of evidence just based on the star ratings and, and fee for services uh, quality programs that um, CMS is able to uh, do so very adeptly um, compared to how quality might be measured in some other uh, form of market. It's, so go ahead, Chris. It, it strikes me that 
we sort of run into the same selection problem with quality as well. The if you're a uh, low income beneficiary or a beneficiary of a kind that's in more challenging healthcare circumstances, your plan will get scored as lower quality, and plans serving that kind of beneficiary will get served as, as lower quality. So not only is there that bias, but we also run into the strange conceptual problem that. Um, if you're an enrollee that is in a neighborhood served only by bad plans or lower quality plans, you you yourself are punished for the fact that there are no good plans in your area because your voucher amount is effectively reduced. Your, your The share of the rebate dollars that can be provided as supplemental benefits is reduced. And also the, um, the add-on bonus payment is reduced. So we're, we're punishing um, beneficiaries for the fact that they don't have the choice of good plans, which is a bit of an absurd situation. The, the, the quality bonus uh, plan, I, I get why it was set up, but it, it, it seems so theoretically confused that it really doesn't make, make any sense at all. So uh, I, I uh, uh, appreciate the, the dialogue on that, but I think we should move on to another uh, important component of the paper, which is that in addition to talking about way, ways that MA can improve, the paper also talked about fee-for-service and particularly the, the interactions fee-for-service has with MA. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Chris, uh, since you ha had the mic here already, what do you think are, are the most important interactions between fee-for-service and MA? And are there important opportunities uh, to make improvements in that regard? Well, I, I think it's sort of, we struggle to, I think a lot of this reflects our deep struggle to really have all these plans competing on equal terms on a level playing field. And I think ultimately we all kind of want we all want the Medicare program to be dominated by the most efficient um, deliver, del uh, delivery vehicle, uh, whether it be directly through a fee-for-service coverage or through managed care or through a staff model or any kind of PPO or any kind of uh, whatever insurance system is, is most appropriate and most cost-effective. I think we all kind of share that, that objective. But having fee-for-service kind of operate under entirely different rules to uh, to manage to manage care or, or MA plans really kind of frustrates that. We used to have private fee-for-service, which essentially was fee-for-service competing on level terms with MA. I, I think that would be the natural way to go to the extent we, that we want beneficiaries to have the fee-for-service experience of the sort that they currently enjoy with Medigap. That, that, that's a totally reasonable thing for seniors to want. That they should pay for it. They should pay for the the entire additional cost associated with that. And so, having fee for service plans operate within MA or having a Medigap a Medigap like plan operate, it should be under MA rules. So, I I would like to see fee for service or fee for service like Medigap plans really operate within Medicare Advantage, not outside of it. And I think that's the only way we're going to get some real parity in terms of. Uh, not just the, the amount of federal payments provided to plans, but then also the regulatory burden and the associated costs of regulations the plans are required to uh, operate under. Like, for instance, like the, the, the effective costs of an out-of-pocket cap, whatever efficiency gains there might be of uh, blending A and B, whatever uh, ability there might be to integrate the cost-sharing structure and, and so on and so forth. It seems to be that having fee-for-service entirely distinct from, from um, Medicare Advantage is a bit of a, I mean, there are obviously historical reasons why it, it works that way, but it, it seems like a very odd way to, to run a, a healthcare program. Others have thoughts on that, Lauren? Uh, well, possibly. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I mean, I think I agree that there is some sort of uh, consensus here on the sort of moving to some level playing field here, and I, I think a lot of the points that Chris makes and that the paper makes are right on sort of, uh, you know, taking away some of the inherent advantages that traditional Medicare has. I think the the only point I, I'd really add is that I think some of it is some of that sort of leveling of the playing field should also be, uh, you know, sort of evening out some of the disadvantages that traditional Medicare has right now, in particular, just that it doesn't have an out-of-pocket cap, especially once you start messing with Medigap, uh, which I think is a reasonable policy. Um, I think just having every plan in the country, Medicare Advantage requires it, all private plans, there's required to have an out-of-pocket maximum, but traditional Medicare doesn't. 
um, or at least in the part A and B benefit now, uh, right? We even fixed that in, that in part D, uh, right? Like that that to me just seems, if you're going to sort of have a level playing field, I think you need some of the base insurance properties. Um, and really like that is sort of a core insurance property that there is some limit on what you can owe in a year. I think that's sort of the biggest one. People can talk about, oh, maybe there should be some, you know, prior auth built into the traditional Medicare program as well. Uh, you know, I think there are other avenues to go down, but I, I do think it is a little bit of a two-way street um, and sort of like making the programs look a little bit more similar so that it really is, uh, you know, sort of a fair competition here. Um, I'll, I'll just jump in um, with one other um, topic as well. I mean, yeah, Medi Medigap and benefit design are both um, things that we that the paper tries to address a, a, a great deal. I'll just also put a, a plug in for the uh, policy related to enrollment process. Um, and so currently there is a default enrollment in fee for service Medicare. And I mean, especially given that the center of gravity of the program has changed somewhat, there's questions about, okay, well, should there be a new default? Should MA be the default? And the approach that um, I took in the paper was more of trying to use the enrollment process and, and enshrine this in statute as well, try to direct more of a choice between the two options. Um, to some extent, there's going to have to be some allowances made for people who are unable to make that decision. Um, but having the but but ha having the uh, default option currently in fee for service a a a without having an extended period of time to really actively uh, encourage uh, patients to shop for coverage or be aware of their coverage options or understand what is it um, on as much of an apples to apples basis as you can um, each program offers, um, it's going to lead to a lot of people to assume, well, you know, this is the default option, so maybe it's the best option for me. This is something that is a, a problem in many other types of markets as well. And so trying to move away from that and have more of a clear um, decision point um, it makes more sense given where Medicare as a whole is right now. And it, it also would be part of that hallmark of I mean, I'm supportive of MA because it offers choice of coverage and encouraging that choice just kind of seems to be part of the same uh, theme. So as, as Joe Paper highlights uh, when it discusses all of the various uh, kinds of proposals out there, this is uh, this whole area and the set of topics we've discussed and several beyond are, are such a lively area of, of debate right now. There are a lot of uh, discussions happening on the Hill and the executive branch and the policy community. Uh, I'd like to ask each of our uh, panelists here uh, whether there's a one important development that they'd like to highlight for the audience. And, and while they answer that, I just want to remind the audience uh, that uh, we invite your question and answer uh, here in the, in the Zoom button at the bottom of your Zoom uh, window as well. Let's Let's start with Lauren. Sure. Uh, thanks for that. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, I think sort of made some of the key points here. I, I think one just sort of last piece I, I, I think worth highlighting here is, um, I mean, so one, I think obviously there's a potential policy debate here. And I think Medicare Advantage does make sense whether there is ever sort of a deficit reduction package or, uh, you know, as sort of the, uh, as part of a broader, I, I think there's sort of avenue for kind of a let's clean up Medicare as a whole package that isn't necessarily uh, whether it saves money or not, I, I think there's sort of value to, I think we've talked through here a number of things that are just improvements uh, to kind of the infrastructure of Medicare, which, uh, right, I, it's, it doesn't seem wild to change a little bit of what we're thinking about now that Medicare Advantage has become half the program. Uh, so I, I do think part of it is key. And then the other piece on the sort of the same lines of like, right, it's half the program now is, right, we have like basic, we have very little data on the Medicare Advantage program. The government collects amazing data on the traditional Medicare program. We have like this amazing claims data that, that the researchers can access and try to understand better the program, understand where the flaws are. Um, and we just have very little insight into Medicare Advantage right now. Uh, we have this sort of like data that tells you like when an encounter happens, but it doesn't tell you what the price that's paid. It doesn't tell you the patient cost sharing, uh, right? You don't know anything about the non-fee-for-service payments that happen in Medicare Advantage, which Supposedly, like capitation is a very big part of Medicare Advantage, and we just have like very little insight into what's happening and how these uh, these payments are happening. So I 
I do think that's a sort of a key thing is like, as this is a huge part of the program, we really just need to be able to better understand and better study uh, the program because just Medicare Advantage is going to have bumps in the road as well. Um, and being able to kind of understand those and improve them uh, is going to be essential. Josh, do you have uh, others to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I will uh, do a little add on to that just to point out that especially with the supplemental benefits and the utilization and cost of those, we, we just know nothing really. And um, so there is a movement on the Hill to have more transparency into at least that, which I think will help researchers kind of more fully understand what happens when you do start um, these bigger reforms to those supplemental benefits. So uh, that would be my like small step. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, again, along the lines of what, what Lauren said, um, if we're worried about the long-term fiscal future, and certainly CRFB is worried about that, and if you're worried about the growth of spending programs and entitlement programs, uh, then you have to have Medicare Advantage part of that discussion. Uh, and so whether it's a reform of traditional Medicare and MA at the same time, or if we're just going to do tweaks to MA, which I know all of that is politically uh, and and sort of difficult from a policy uh, perspective. But we we do need to do that if we're concerned about the long-term fiscal future. Um, and uh, I think no matter how hard that path may be, uh, we know that we're there are overpayments in this program. And so we at least shouldn't be falling for kind of the hysterical pleas of health insurers every year that CMS comes out with their rate notice and doesn't give the exact um, raise and rates that, that insurers expect. Um, and, and I hope that doesn't become an annual thing with Super Bowl ads and like major lobbying things because we, we know there's a lot of money here and we should at least let CMS do the right thing and then worry about broader reforms from a congressional perspective, especially if it's part of a bigger fiscal uh, package to get the, the national debt on a downward trajectory. Chris? I, th I think the, um, the, the way to look at MA's challenge going forward is really in the context of Medicare's biggest challenge, I think, which is the new technology challenge. Um, like partly this is the um, the rise of this these extremely expensive new drugs, like the anti-obesity drugs, uh, the Alzheimer's drugs that are likely to, to, to sort of increasingly reach the market, which are going to be really kind of considered in isolation, just enormously, uh, almost unfeasibly large. Um, and I think we're 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 gonna we're increasingly gonna have to confront the fact that fee for service can only do like a yay or a nay across the board or a price control across the board, which means essential government regulation of in, uh, of innovation and financing of innovation. And MA really offers like an alternative to that um, because it can it can provide more flexible financing beyond the payment silos. It doesn't just have to say this is come for everybody at this price. You can sort of have trade offs and uh, more of a conversation about savings and offsets within uh, other expenditures, and you can have more of a business conversation, which is going to be more um, hospitable to investment. There are challenges to that. But there's also, I think, the fact that MA is a capitated program um, and a risk-adjusted capitated program especially, it sort of creates a softer, more elastic um, source of financing for these innovations without either having to say complete yes to everything or complete no to everything. And I think that's going to be the value of the program is, is as a sort of a, a cushion and a, buff, and a buffer that sort of allows us to pay for these incremental technological innovations without really having to, um, w without really having to say complete open-ended yes or an open-ended no or a kind of a arbitrary price control. And I think this is especially going to be true um, the more the AI revolutionizes the delivery of care, is that really is going to be much more leaning towards capitated payment models. It's very hard to think about um, how that's going to work, how software as a medical device really within um, fee-for-service payment silos. It, re it already doesn't work very well with telehealth, with a doctor having a phone call. We kind of arbitrarily patch things. It's going to work less and less over time. And I think fee-for-service 
we're going to find increasingly poorly suited to the nature of medical care delivery in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, we really should should say, and, and thankfully the beneficiaries are already largely moving over to, to, to Medicare Advantage plans. That is going to be the chassis for the future of healthcare delivery. It, it's, it's, um, it's definitely got big challenges that we face in terms of how benchmarks are set, how risk adjustment is set, how we do the coding. But in terms of when we think about what healthcare is going to look like in 20 years' time, it's really going to be some kind of risk-adjusted capitation. It's only in the Medicare space. It's very hard to sort of... I, I think people who try and sort of modernize fee for service are, are largely wasting their efforts because it's really trying to it's trying to put a, a, a motor on a on a horse and buggy. It's it's not the way that you really want to think of things going forward. Joe, I don't want to leave you out. Um, I'll I'll just quickly add, and this is echoing a lot of what was already said. But I mean the 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 trust fund solvency date um, is 2031. Um, it's fluctuated in the past. It could very well. Uh, come up sooner and certainly the conversation should happen in advance of that um i mean the the, the paper does focus on ma and it, it's definitely not an, an exhaustive list because there's plenty to do in fee for service too and even in the paper that was about ma uh, i couldn't help but talk about some things in fee for service that could incrementally be fixed so obviously there's no shortage of areas to um try to find savings but um i, I guess i would just to end by emphasizing that the, um, I mean, the package we have is is about savings, and it's also about trying to improve the quality of the coverage itself. Um, and I think that it, it's going to be important to take that balanced approach. Um, this, those, these don't necessarily need to come at the expense of each other, because I think there's enough efficiencies and wiggle room in MA that come from those efficiencies to achieve good things while also being more um uh, being more protective of taxpayer equities. Um, so I'll, that, that's what I'll, I'll just kind of say is that w when we put together this package, we tried to make sure that there's um, pl plenty of things um, on, on both ends, not only because, I mean, that makes it more of a, a bipartisan uh, policy, but also because it's something that we're, we're trying to achieve many good things simultaneously. And hopefully there is a way to um, thread that needle. Thank you all. Uh, this uh, really has been uh, fascinating to see all of you from your, with your different perspective and emphasis uh, dive so deeply. And I think we've covered a lot in the hour that we've had. We have some good audience questions as well. Uh, one question uh, that uh, that came in is around tiered coding intensity and how difficult uh, that may be. And I wanted to ask, uh, start with Joe uh, a little bit here, which is to say, uh, the paper recommends that uh, Congress put a statutory cap on, you know, that, that, that Congress make changes to how coding intensity adjustment is, is made, uh, that it tiers it, and then that Congress also put a statutory cap on, on the amount. Uh, does that is that related to the difficulty of tiering? Is that what, where, what is the thinking behind uh, putting that cap in there? Um, I mean, th there will certainly be difficulties that administratively um, folks at CMS would um, need to work through. But I think having the statutory um, maximum is something that it imposes a guardrail so that, um, you know, especially when you become untethered from the current 5.9%. Uh, currently, I mean, CMS does have some leeway in, in increasing that and has not done so. But once it, there is a more open invitation to do so, um, it makes sense to have those guardrails so that um, you can have all, all kinds of issues with, with data or with estimating coding intensity for specific plans or for certain other subsets. And uh, again, it's, it's just about making sure that there's not a, um, an, a temptation to overcorrect or um, potentially have other unintended consequences in specific market segments, whether that be a geographic or um, with certain types of coverage options. Lauren, I think you were the uh, person who mentioned particularly the difficulty of tiered coding intensity. I don't know if you have more you want to, but the discussion and question has prompted. Yeah, I mean, so the, just the, the Q&A question, I mean, certainly the RADB, like going after sort of more, right, you know, the sort of uh, egregious coding um, is useful. I just, There's just a lot of random variation that is part of, uh, right, that it's, just, it's hard to make a plan specific coding intensity adjustment just because some of it is going to be random variation in how much spending uh, there really is. Uh, you know, you can look to like mortality rates in broad segments. You can maybe try to narrow in a little bit, 
I, I guess I tend to be skeptical that there's much you can really do with the scalpel here. And I, I, th that raises real questions. I don't want to, I, I think the, the sort of questioner raises questions about like what do small plans do? Certainly that creates a barrier to entry that you kind of have to know how to like really code intensely to do this. It, there is some possibility that this becomes more simple to some degree, like, like there's just someone you can pay to get some software to like do a lot of the, like a lot of what they're doing is just ac get access to an EHR and like mine for codes and then tell the doctors what codes they have. But you know, some of it is, you know, plan there's a lot of plans who own doctors or we you know, own doctor practices within Medicare Advantage. And obviously that helps. And that could be Kaiser Permanente or Optum or Humana is doing a lot of this now, right? That's sort of a big part of it. I, I think that is, I, I do think that's one of the cautions. I. I guess I don't really have a great solution to that. I think that is just sort of one of the, it's sort of one of the downsides of Medicare Advantage and there are positives, but to me, it is just sort of one of the, uh, one of the downsides you have to kind of think about here. Thank you. One of the other uh, questions talked about whether there's an opportunity to roll out uh, some of the kinds of initiatives CMMI or, or has undertaken uh, with regards to models in both the fee-for-service and Medicare Advantage side. And, and uh, it, it kind of prompts this question of uh, whether or not uh, you think that the government, uh, either CMS through its existing authority or uh, Congress, ought to be uh, kind of engaged in, uh, how, to what extent they ought to be engaged in exactly how Medicare Advantage plans pay for the particular items and services. Uh, you know, Lauren, I, I heard you talking about more data. And so I wondered whether there's a sort of a connection there. Is the data that you're looking for because you think that there ought to be a greater role in deciding how these contracts ought to be uh, set up and whether and the government maybe ought to have a greater role in determining what the payment rates are and doing initiatives like a joint replacement in MA? Or were you thinking something else? So I was thinking something else. I think it's sort of the, the whole point of MA is to allow plans to think about how payments should work and for them to kind of innovate and they can choose if a bundled payment is going to save money, there's plenty of incentive for them to do this. I think ACOs are sort of a way to kind of quasi copy some of the incentives that exist within Medicare Advantage on sort of a lighter, uh, on a lighter touch to some degree. So no, I don't, I don't think we should kind of get in the business of telling them how to, to sort of how to pay for services. I, I think it is just that we really don't have much idea how some of these payments are flowing. And some of this is like, you know, medical loss ratio issues where there clearly are some contracts and there's, you know, there's been like anecdotes here where it is basically like, you know, plan tells a provider group, look, like you're getting 85% of premium. And if you kind of can save money, we're just going to throw all that money at you and you're going to like share that with us or we're actually all the same company and it's automatically shared. Uh, right, right. I think there's sort of that question, which would be helpful uh, to get it here. Uh, part of it is just, I think it is useful. I, I think Medicare Advantage can office, often give us insights into what should happen in the traditional Medicare program. I have less of a, uh, a sort of uh, nihilistic view about the program than maybe Chris does here, that I think there is uh, value in having sort of a robust traditional Medicare program. Um, so some of it, I think, is being able to kind of see what they're doing there also can kind of give you ideas for, uh, you know, improving the traditional Medicare program. We got a question about prior authorization. I wanted to ask you, uh, the panelists, what do you think is the future of prior authorization? Uh, frankly, not just in MA, but uh, even though the, the question focuses in particular on the recent uh, CMS rule that's focused on plans, but is there a role for prior authorization of fee-for-service? Uh, there's some limited demonstration projects there. Is that something that you think should or could or would ever be expanded? And uh, what about prior authorization in MA? Is there a danger of going too far? So I think ultimately this is a question about utilization and inappropriate utilization. How do you want to police inappropriate utilization? We have several tools to do that. We can we can do it with cost sharing, which, you know, does it to some to certain degree, but comes with real downsides, which are pretty obvious. You can do ex post care den denials of care or denials of reimbursement, which is a really bad way of doing it. So I don't think anyone's seriously advocating that. So the opposite of that is doing a denial of reimbursement before you actually produce the care or to, uh, deliver the care, which is, is it seems the appropriate time to to deny reimbursement. So in theory, like 
it's one of the better ways of denying inappropriate utilization. Um, I think the people who are most opposed to prior authorization um, just seem to be opposed to any control over inappropriate utilization at all. It's not like they're strong advocates of uh, rescissions or of, uh, or of cost sharing or like they're, they just don't want any real oversight over claims, which is understandable if you're a provider. But from a, a pragmatic point of view, it seems um, very strange to to just be for, for someone who, who's sort of genuinely interested in the integrity of the program to be entirely opposed to it. Um, now, I'm not saying the prior should be the the, the instrument that, that solves every uh, uh, issue of inappropriate utilization. Quite the opposite. We should have other tools as well. But should it be part of the tool, part of the toolbox? I, I think absolutely it can be in certain circumstances, a pretty helpful tool. And the, the blanket um, a desire to sort of not have a blanket prohibition on, on prior auth just seems absurd. And certainly it can be useful in, in many circumstances. So I, I think that's the way to think about it. Could it, could it be useful in fee-for-service potentially? But there are lots of things that are potentially useful in fee-for-service, like an out-of-pocket cap. And we can spend like 40 years talking about things that are in theory useful in fee-for-service and not get very far because it's pretty hard to get them done. You may be sorry for asking, Chris, uh, in a good way. Uh, anyone else uh, have a thought on to, to pile on to that? I mean, I'll, I'll just, I mean, because this is such a live issue on the Hill to some degree, I mean, it is worth um, separating, at least it's worth health policy scholars separating, which I think we do, the concept of prior authorization and maybe some ways that some companies are using computer programs to do it without being connected to what's happening in the real world um, for that patient and that provider. Uh, my fear is that on the Hill, uh, it all gets lumped together. And so you have horror stories about AI denying care turning into like getting rid of prior authorization in Medicare Advantage, which I think um, is actually uh, maybe a stalking horse for just getting rid of Medicare Advantage. But um, there are some supporters of Medicare Advantage who also um, support getting rid of prior authorization, and that um, I think is uh, incongruous and, and doesn't make very much sense. So um, I think we just have to deal with if we have a private sector alternative, um, it, the way that those insurance companies save money is by using tools like prior authorization. And you really um, wouldn't have a functioning private insurance system in MA that's really competing with fee-for-service if they weren't allowed to use tools like prior authorization uh, networks of providers. I mean, that's kind of the basic building blocks of why you have um, a private insurance system. Well, I, I appreciate the panelists, uh, not only for their participation in this discussion today, for uh, their discussions and engagement with Paragon on these and other issues, as part of the health policy community, uh, just grateful and humbled to be a part of such a knowledgeable group and uh, glad as well for the participation of the audience and the interest in Paragon's work. So uh, thank you all for participating today and we look forward to hearing more from you in the future.